Welcome. Today we're going to be talking about simplicial and singular homology. In particular, we're going to be talking about simplicial homology. Now, singular homology is the most important type of homology uh, theory when we're talking about algebraic topology. However, simplicial homology is a lot easier to understand. And we'll soon see that simplicial and singular homologies actually produce the same groups. So let's start with simplicial homology. In particular, we're going to be talking about delta complexes. So we're going to be starting with delta complexes. Now, in order to understand delta complexes, we're going to look at three examples. In particular, we're going to be looking at the torus, the real projective plane, and the Klein bottle. So the torus is normally denoted as T, the real projective plane as RP2, and the Klein bottle as K. Now the torus is something we already know. That's just a big donut. But we can represent the torus, real projective plane, and the Klein bottle as a diagram on a square or a rectangle. So by associating the two ends with each other going in the same direction, uh, both the same way, we get the torus. RP2, we have the same demarcations of the two opposite sides, but in this case, unlike the torus, where both arrows were going in the same direction, we're going to flip the directions. So we essentially have two twists in a rectangle. And the Klein bottle is kind of a hybrid of those two, where we have the top and bottom ends going in the same direction, and we have a twist on the left and right ends that are being associated with each other. All right, so let's start by taking a look at the torus, and then we can apply the same thing to the real projective plane and the Klein bottle. So the first thing we should note is that all of these vertices have the same label. Okay, If this is V, then because we're associating our top part here with our bottom part here, and we have that when we fold around, we essentially have a cylinder. So this side is associated with that side. So the, the top and bottom vertices are the same. Additionally, since this side, uh, this left side here, is associated with the right side, our vertices are mirror images. So V and V. Okay. That's one thing to note about the torus. That is not the case in the real projective plane, but it is the case in the Klein bottle. And we'll see that in a second. Now, the first thing to note, uh, the second thing to note about the torus is that we can triangulate this. We can take a diagonal cutting across from one vertex to the other, and we can call this edge C. It doesn't matter which orientation we give it. We could have given it the orientation going down or up. It really doesn't matter. Now, let's call the upper triangle, uh, let's get really creative and call it U, and the lower triangle, we'll call that L. 
Now we've triangulated them. And as it turns out, any polygon in two dimensions can be broken down into triangles. So let's see another example of that. Um, let's move down to the real projective plane. So the real projective plane, denoted RP2, has opposites on top and opposites on the bottom. and we can cut this by a diagonal. Okay, we'll call that diagonal C. Now we've broken it up into U and L again, upper and lower triangles. And the only other thing to notice about RP2 is that it has two distinct vertices instead of one distinct vertex like the torus did. So if we call this guy V, and we identify our edges, so we twist uh, A and A and connect those, we'll have, a, uh, we'll have a Mobius strip, and then we'll take the open ends, twist that, and we actually get symmetry about the diagonal. So... Uh, C is actually just connecting V to itself. And we'll see that if you just do the construction, uh, W, we'll just call that the other vertex. W is going to be the other one, just by the identifications on the sides. We actually don't need C to determine how many distinct vertices we have. Our third example for this is the Klein bottle. Okay, remember the Klein bottle is K, and it has the same edges going on the top and bottom, and opposite directions going on the left and right. So if we label bottom left guy V, when we identify the top and bottom, we have V on the top. And now when we twist it, this V gets associated down here. And this V gets associated up here. So we have all of our edges, or, or all of our vertices, rather, have the same demarcation, and there's only one vertex. So we can triangulate this again. U, L, call this guy C. And those are our triangulations of the three examples we started with. What about something that isn't a square? Can we triangulate that? So let's go ahead and ask that question. So can we triangulate a polygon that is not a square? or a rectangle, or some other four-sided object? And the answer to this is yes, of course we can. And in order to see that, let's just throw, well, uh, let's throw, say, a shape that isn't necessarily regular but we'll identify our sides. Maybe this guy will be A. This will be B. We'll call this guy A. We'll have B going in the other direction. Maybe A, a D. And going in the other direction, A, C. 
Okay, so the question is, can we triangulate this? And the answer is going to be yes. So let's go ahead and triangulate this using green. So if we call this our vertex as our starting point, we can draw a line from V to this intersection of A and B. Draw that a little clear. Okay, and give it, let's just say that orientation. We can draw another one going to this vertex and then one more going to this vertex. And we've triangulated this polynomial or I guess polygon. So this is kind of the foundation for what a simplex is. So a simplex we'll call it an n-simplex, is the generalization of triangulation to n-dimensions. So what can we say about what a simplex is in general? Well, uh, let's look at a couple of examples as to what an n simplex is in several different dimensions n. So we're going to have n, which is our dimension. And an example of an n simplex. So let's start with dimension zero. And an example of a zero simplex is just a point, right? It's a zero dimensional object. Okay, a one dimensional simplex is going to be a straight line or a line segment rather. So we'll call this V naught and we'll call this V1 and it'll have to have an orientation. Okay. Two dimensions. This is the one that we've been dealing with. So a two simplex is going to be a triangle. And we'll call the edges here V naught, V1, and V2. And we'll put an orientation around it. And in general, the standard orientation is counterclockwise. And finally, the last dimension that we can deal with and make sense of is three dimensions. So a three-dimensional simplex is a tetrahedron. So let's go ahead and try to draw one of those. Okay. So we'll start with a triangle. and have a three-dimensional aspect to it. And we'll call this one V0, V1, uh, V2, and back here we'll call this guy V3. Okay. So our standard orientation is still counterclockwise, but it's a little bit trickier because each face is also oriented counterclockwise, and that's going to tell us the orientation of the whole thing. So it's going to look 
like a two simplex on every side of our tetrahedron. Okay, and that is kind of the, that's a, a big takeaway from this, is that when we look at two simplices or three simplices, we always have all simplices of lower dimension. So when we have an n simplex, we also have uh, zero simplices, uh, one simplices, so on until n minus one simplices. So let's look at our tetrahedron again to get an understanding as to what we actually mean. So let's go ahead and put our V3 out here and we'll connect it. So V0, V1, V2, and we'll connect it like that. Oh no. Okay. And we'll have our tetrahedron here. Okay, so if we just look at the triangle V naught, V1, V2, that's that's a two simplex. And in this two simplex, uh well, let's look at all the two simplices we have. So we have v0, v1, v2. We have v0, v2, v3. So we have v0, v1, v2, v0, v2, v3, and v0, v1, v3. Okay, and then if we take that away, uh, our vertex v0, we also have v1, v2, v3. So these are all of our two simplices. In each two simplex, we'll just extract v0, v1, v2. We have three, uh, we have three one simplices. So we have the one simplices, the line v0, v1, the line v0, v2, and the line v1, v2. And in the one simplex, uh, v0, v1, we have the two zero simplices v0 and v1. Okay. So this is the tetrahedrons, the three simplex. Okay. Notice in the three simplex, we have four two simplices. And in every two simplex, we have three one simplices. And every one simplex, we have two zero simplices. Now that we've seen an example, let's go ahead and look at some notation and some standard terminology. So, by definition, a vertex of a simplex is what we standardly
think of as a vertex. So it's what we think of. as a vertex. Okay, so uh, as an example of this, let's look at the two simplex, v0, v1, v2. So our vertices are v0, v1, and v2. And with the vertex, we will actually write down our simplex in terms of the vertices. So an n simplex will be denoted by its vertices. So uh, an n simplex, which is called uh, delta with a superscript n, will be written as v0, v1, and so on to vn with these square brackets. Okay, so now if we have a standard n simplex, delta n, and we can write it as the set of points t0 up to tn, and we can actually embed it directly in n plus 1 dimensional space. And we'll have the condition that the sum of t sub i is equal to 1 over i. And every t sub i is positive. So to kind of get an example, a feel of what's going on here, Let's look at delta 2. So that's the set of points uh, t0, t1, t2. Since there's three points, it has to be in R3. And our condition is that the sum of the t sub i's, so we can say that t0 plus t1 plus t2 is equal to 1, and t1, t2, t3 have to be greater than or equal to 0. So what does this look like? Well, if we were to draw it, uh, embed it in R3, maybe we'll reorient it. So we'll just have the first quadrant. Because everything has to be positive, it can only lie in the first quadrant. So we'll call this our t naught axis, our t1 axis, and our t2 axis. So t naught, t1 are 0. t2 is going to have to be 1. The same for the other two. And if t1 is, say, 1 half, t0 and t2 will have to make up for it. So what we end up getting is we end up getting a triangle in 3 space. And it's actually the shaded face. of the triangle. Okay. 
So um, this is what a standard two simplex looks like in R3. Now let's take a look at a generic point on this two simplex. So we'll pick maybe a point here on the two simplex and that has coordinates uh, A, B, C. Right? So let's call this point A, B, C in R3. Now the point A, B, C is actually a sum of T sub i, um, in our case, we can actually make it concrete. We could say it's T1 times V1 plus T2 times V2 plus T0 times V0. And let's just go ahead and move T0, V0, and T1, V1. So We'll just slide this over, move this over here. Okay, so it's actually a linear combination of our vectors or our vertices V0, V1, and V2. So this point, we'll call it just the vector V or a point V in our two simplex is a linear combination of of V1 or V0, V1 and V2. So we can expand this to any n simplex. So we can expand. So if we have a delta, uh, we have delta n, an n simplex, we can actually write this as the sum of t sub i v sub i where t sub i is in the reals um, because t sub i is a coefficient and v sub i are our vertices that is delta n is equal to v0, v1, all the way up to vn. Now, this is in direct one-to-one -one correspondence with our points t sub i. So we have the points t0, t1, and tn, and those are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the sum of t sub i, v sub i, from 1 to n. So this is a point, and this is also a point. We could think about this as uh, coefficients that are scaling unit vectors, where v sub i is a unit vector. So the coefficients T sub i 
are the barycentric. coordinates. Of the point. Either written as an ordered n tuple or written as the sum. As I ranges from zero to n. And let's go ahead and fix that up here. So those are barycentric coordinates. It's if I'm given a point in an n simplex, the numbers themselves are the barycentric coordinates. Or if we write it as a sum, it's the coefficients of the vectors. Next up, we're going to talk about faces. So if I'm given a simplex, so given a simplex here, v naught all the way to vn, a face of a uh, delta simplex, so a face of delta n is a subsimplex. So the face is the new concept, and a subsimplex is something that we've already seen. Looking back to our example where we broke down the tetrahedron into its component triangles and then into its component line segments and then its component vertices, we saw that there are a lot of subsimplices of a tetrahedron. So when we talk about a subsimplex, we are looking at a, vert a subsimplex with vertices. of any non-empty collection of the VIs. So looking at an example, maybe we want to list all faces of delta 2. And remember that delta 2 is the simplex v0, v1, v2. So remember when we're listing all the faces, we're looking at all subsimplices possible. And the first thing to note is that it doesn't have to be a proper subsimplex. So delta 2 itself is a face. Next we have all of our one simplices. Well, our one simplices are going to be v0, v1, v0, v2, and v1, v2. Okay, so let's just draw a two simplex over here. We'll call this v0, v1, and v2. So this whole shaded in triangle is our two simplex. Now, our one simplices are going to be this guy here. So v0, v1. Uh, v0, v2 
and v1, v2. So here's v1, v2. And it should actually have an orientation going the same way as our simplex, as our original simplex. So v0, v2 is not a valid one simplex, but if we reverse the order, we do have one. So if we just switch this to v2, v0, we actually have all of our one simplices. Remember that our standard orientation is counterclockwise. And now let's look at our zero simplices. Okay. Remember our zero simplices are just our vertices. So our vertices are V0, V1, and V2. So in total, uh, let's just go ahead and label these. So this is a zero simplex, this is a zero simplex, and this is a zero simplex. So in total, a two simplex has delta two, it has three one simplices and three zero simplices. So it has a total of seven faces.